They say that hindsight is 2020, which is a year that I started analyzing things that I haven't thought about in years. And apparently so did a lot of people. We are currently in an age where we're looking back at things that have been greatly criticized in the past, but now see it with a new perspective. We're seeing the redemption arcs of movies like Jennifer's Body, Jawbreaker, and to a lesser degree, Twilight. Since I love a good redemption arc, I wanted to look at some movies that were hated by a lot of critics and audiences, but now enjoy beloved cult status years later. I initially wanted to discuss Showgirls, but really, is this movie even known for being hated anymore? I mean, it has eased its way into pop culture. The makeup styles inspired the makeup in Euphoria, though that show is very strange. Showgirls is a theatrical masterpiece, so I have nothing else to add. I was also considering looking into Mariah Carey's semi-biographical drama Glitter, but maybe some, and I mean some, of the criticism was well-deserved since this movie is about as bland as cornflakes. Same goes for Britney Spears' Crossroads. These aren't the worst movies ever made, but their worst offense is just being a bit too dry. Popstar movies are either a critical hit or miss, nothing in between. But for this video, I decided to look at some movies that I've either grown up with or have had some prior knowledge of. You've probably grown up with these movies too. When I got a little bit older, I was a bit taken aback that some of the movies that I've seen millions of times have been denounced as cinematic disgraces, points of shame to the resumes of A-listers. And I was confusion because I was bopping the whole time. But despite the long critiques that some movies have, they hold up a unique place in 2024. Now, I'm not saying that anyone has to like any of the movies I'm about to discuss. If you like them or don't like them, that's cool. And no, I'm not saying that any of these movies are absolutely incredible masterpieces. They do have their faults. What I am saying is that the massive amount of backlash that these movies got were a tad egregious. And that there's some enjoyable things about these movies. Keep in mind that this is all based in my opinion, so you are totally free to agree or disagree. That rhymed. We are about to enter some very artistic territory, so let's get started. Now, in order for me to talk about Batman and Robin, we need some context. 1989's Batman was a massive hit, so naturally sequels needed to be made. Joel Schumacher directed Batman Forever, directing the series towards a more cartoonish and campy aesthetic. When I think about it more, why couldn't the Fiddler be the lead? So here is where all the messiness begins. After the release of Batman Forever, Warner Brothers wanted to put a sequel as fast as possible. In fact, Warner Brothers pretty much set out the blueprint for the direction of this movie. They wanted the fourth installment of the Batman series to be more childish than ever, with a very toyetic atmosphere, meaning that this movie can easily sell branded toys and other products. Due to its very short pre-production stage, the production itself was pretty chaotic. George Clooney hated his actualized Batman suit, which I can't blame him for since he seems to struggle just moving in it. Battery acid was leaking into Arnold's mouth. Chris O'Donnell's mask was glued to his face. He was sweating a lot. It was a mess. Allegedly during filming, Schumacher held his megaphone and shouted before each take, Remember everyone, this is a cartoon. He knew exactly what was going on. When Batman and Robin was released in summer of 1997, it was blasted by critics. They couldn't get enough of dragging this movie. And to say that the fans were shooketh would be an understatement. It turned out to be the disgrace of 1997 and reached number one for Empire's 50 Worst Movies Ever list. There are plenty of movies on that list that are way worse than this, but that's just me. Almost all the critics disapproved of the movie's campy nature, non-serious essence, the costumes, and the neon coloring. But one critic said that this movie was too bland. Batman and Robin was nominated for 11 Razzies, and is considered one of the worst superhero movies ever made. It was credited as unaliving the Batman series, and even the entire superhero genre for a bit. Joel Schumacher even apologized for this movie. Look, I apologize. I want to apologize to every fan that was disappointed because I think I owe them that. Okay, dramatic. Equally dramatic screenwriter Avika Goldsman also apologized, stating, We didn't mean for it to be bad. I swear. Nobody was like, this will be bad. Well, yeah, 
Most productions don't intentionally make something bad, unless they have some money to spare and they feel like starting some mess. Lead actors George Clooney and Chris O'Donnell also made similar apologetic statements, but Uma Thurman said that her involvement in the movie was a fantastic experience and that she enjoyed the movie's cartoony aura. She added a different perspective. Work! Here's where one of the biggest issues with the criticism of Batman and Robin lies. Batman wasn't always this dark, edgy icon. People act as if the 1960s Batman show never existed, which is what I think this movie is trying to remake. And don't forget that these are 90s superhero movies. They are bound to be at least a little bit kitsch. Even Tim Burton's Batman movies had a campy essence. But I guess you need a very specific audience to get into something as proudly camp as Batman and Robin. Theater kids in particular. They don't get catered to enough. I do think that this movie falls flat with its three main leads. Their performances just come across as stiff and awkward. It's like Chris, Alicia, and George said, I'm just here to get my check and go. So the worst characteristic of Batman and Robin is its identity crisis, evidenced by mismatched performance styles. But I don't think it's bad enough to claim worst superhero movie status. Visually, this movie has plenty to offer. The entire universe looks very plasticky. It's like we're inside a life-size dollhouse. And the neon coloring of the city was actually inspired by Tokyo. Now onto the best part. I can't stress enough on how Poison Ivy is that girl. Her villain introduction alone is iconic. You can tell that Uma Thurman had a specific direction for this character, and she went for it. Her performance is giving old Hollywood and Jessica Rabbit vibes. I remember one time in the first grade, I got into a pretty heated discussion with a fellow first grader who told me that Poison Ivy was bad, that she's a supervillain, and I kept saying, no, she's good, without having any backing arguments. I had no prior knowledge of her character, I just decided that she's not evil because I liked her outfit, and that was all I needed in the first grade. <laughs> But when you look back into her motivations, is she really all that bad? She loves plants and nature. If she was in 2024, she'd be one of those plant girlies with an indoor garden. I critique superhero movies quite a bit on this channel, but for the record, I don't hate superhero movies. What I dislike about a lot of superhero movies is their tendency to be a bit too dull and not very engaging. One thing you can say about this movie is that it's certainly not dull or forgettable. Reportedly, test audiences actually gave mostly positive responses before the release. Who knew? And currently, there are a sizable amount of people who genuinely enjoy Batman and Robin, mostly due to the colorful aesthetics, theatricality, and showcasing a different type of Batman character. In the 2020s, it seems like the general public are now getting into media that is shamelessly camp and over the top. Movies like Saltburn in May-December are oh-so-melodramatic and are one of the most talked about movies of 2023. Batman and Robin has sort of a similar tone to Showgirls, so maybe it would get a similar reappreciation amongst fans. Yes, the performances are over-the-top and theatrical. The tone is as cartoonish as one can get. But that's what makes it work. And it's much better than Subsidize Squad, so at least it has that going for it. Dr. Seuss is an American icon. Generations of kids are familiar with his stories. In 1991, the rights to Dr. Seuss's intellectual property have been sold. So now, movie studios can do whatever they want to them. So taking a familiar piece like How the Grinch Stole Christmas and creating a blockbuster out of it seems easy enough. In the pre-production stage, Dr. Seuss's wife, Audrey Gassell, had some creative control in the development process. She had a meticulous vision. This movie had to be big. She requested that any actor submitted for The Grinch must be of comparable stature to Jack Nicholson, Jim Carrey, Robin Williams, and Dustin Hoffman. And the writers and director had to have made at least $1 million from their previous movie. I don't know why, but this is giving me like college essay vibes. Like, you must include 10 scholarly sources and the author must be of credible prestige and all your sources must be written at least three years ago and all those rules had me stressed out. The main focus that the writers were going for was to be as faithful to the original Dr. Seuss book as much as possible. But this time, the Grinch will have an added hipness. That always ends up great. 
and Audrey Gassel had some opinions. In the first draft of the script, she didn't approve of some of the planned jokes and actual innuendos. For this section of this video, I'm going to refer to this movie as How the Grinch because How the Grinch Stole Christmas is a bit too long. So anyways, this was one of the biggest movie productions in years. The making of this went pretty smoothly, except that Jim Carrey had some trauma while playing the Grinch. He hated wearing the Grinch costume, comparing it to being burned alive, and even had to get some CIA training to learn how to tolerate torture. If it was that bad, that must have violated some California labor laws, but I'm not gonna get into that. And he was reportedly very mean to people on set. How fitting. When How the Grinch was released, the reactions were very mixed. This movie wasn't nearly as trashed as Batman and Robin was, but the people that didn't like this movie detested it. Naturally, there was frequent comparisons to the original 1966 TV movie, where the Who's were once wholesome Christmas lovers, in the new version, they're materialistic and mean. And with the remake being considerably dark and sort of Tim Burton-ish, I guess a lot of people were thrown off. The most common criticism stated that How the Grinch completely missed the point of the original Dr. Seuss story, or didn't even care about it, and that it was just a cheapened, nonsensical version of it. Some viewers speculated that Dr. Seuss would have hated this movie if he saw it, but then again, he didn't like the original How the Grinch movie, so it's not easy to impress the creator. Just ask Stephen King. Parents especially didn't approve of this movie due to its dark, edgy, and mature style of humor. I vaguely remember some parents in my preschool class describing this movie as inappropriate. But that might have been the reason why I got into it as a kid. But despite all the controversy, it was a huge hit. How the Grinch was the sixth highest grossing movie of 2000 and earned almost $300 million in DVD sales. In an industry where the money is the final word, it seems like all the criticisms basically didn't matter. While How the Grinch isn't perfect, I couldn't help but wonder if some of the criticisms of this movie came from bias, or at least sort of from bias. If How the Grinch wasn't a Dr. Seuss adaption made for kids, I don't think that critics would be as hard on it. Most of this movie focuses on a little girl who does not mind her business and learns about the lifestyle of the common introvert. The Grinch himself is a petty icon. Everyone in town did him wrong, so he's gonna snatch up their Christmas in return. But it's okay because they just decide at the end that Christmas isn't about the presents. This happens out of nowhere, but yay! When you really think about this movie, the central theme is nihilism. I mentioned earlier that some criticisms focus on how shallow and materialistic the Who's are, when in reality, I think that's just the writers adapting to the time. In the 60s, there was heavy commercialization of Christmas, but the idea of Christmas being a corporate entity was pretty new. By the 2000s, trends were getting shorter lifespans, and currently whatever is in demand right now could become tired and passe within a week. That's a pretty nihilistic way on how we spend. Eventually, 5th graders are going to get tired of Sephora, and I'm very looking forward to that. One thing that dates this movie is the very early 2000s Dutch angles, but other than that, How the Grinch was pretty ahead of its time. There is some commentary on the American tradition of overconsumption, which is one topic that pretty much every YouTuber has covered, including myself. The Christmas setting is the cherry on top. Do you know what is really frightening about Christmas? actually interacting with people. Ew. There's a few of those Grinch being relatable for X amount of minutes videos. Maybe the message of this movie is to encourage all the nihilistic introverts with FOMO, also known as Generation Z, to not be afraid to open yourself up a bit. I feel like we now have more introverts than ever before. Or maybe introverts are now making their voices known, stemming from an extrovert commenting, you know, you're like really quiet. Well, yes. And? In 2018, there was an animated Grinch movie, which is now the highest grossing Christmas movie ever. I've never seen it, but it seems like it reflects on how the live action version has gotten sort of a redemption arc. While it was controversial in 2000, How the Grinch is now accepted as an iconic Christmas movie, and no more controversial Dr. Seuss movies were ever made again. So picture this. It was spring 2020, and much like a lot of people at that time, I was a Y2K girly. I was obsessed with everything early 2000s. 
Bratz, movies like 13 Going on 30, all that stuff. So instead of watching Mean Girls for the 36th time that month, I thought of other movies that had a similar Y2K aesthetic. I somehow came across Josie and the Pussycats, and it was not what I expected. Josie and the Pussycats was a comic strip published by Archie Comics in the 1960s, following the lives of a rock band. It would gain further popularity in the 1970s as a Saturday morning cartoon show, and it wouldn't be mentioned for three decades. But in 1991, The Addams Family came out and was a huge hit, so there was a trend of making comedy movies based off of older TV shows. In the early 2000s, pop music was massive, so a movie about Josie and the Pussycats would come out at the perfect time. The writers of this movie also wrote a very pretty sequel, so I can presume that they intended a Josie and the Pussycats movie to be self-reflexive and maybe play on the strangeness of making a movie about a short-lived Saturday morning show. On more than one occasion, we are reminded that we are watching a movie. Interestingly, Beyonce auditioned for this movie, but the directors felt that she came across as too shy for the role of Valerie. Based off the visuals, I think there was heavy inspiration from Spice World, looking modern and trendy, but simultaneously very camp. So this was set to appeal to the comic book and cartoon fans, as well as the general public. So what did they think of this movie? They felt uncertain because Josie and the Pussycats immediately got a mixed response. Some critics thought it was fun, but others felt that it was too ridiculous. Some critics didn't like the product placements, and others didn't like the music. Roger Ebert once said, The music is pretty bad. Maybe it's supposed to sound like brainless preteen fodder, but it's not good enough at being bad to be funny, and stops at merely at the bad stage. I don't know what he was talking about, like, the bops were bopping. And this came out in 2001, so naturally a girl-centered movie would have the expected response of snobbery. Look up the concept of the girl show ghetto. I might do a video about that. But the biggest backlash that this movie got was from Archie Comics. They hated the not even super explicit language and adult themes that the movie portrayed. But interestingly, in 2017, Archie Comics happily promoted Riverdale, which had a much darker tone and more egregious adult themes. So they hated this movie, but they loved this. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in, and I don't want to fit in. Upon its release, Josie and the Pussycats was a box office flop. It didn't even return its budget. It's possible that viewers felt like it was in one of those purgatory of being too childish for adults and too adult for kids. Though it didn't do well financially, Josie and the Pussycats is one of the most beautifully strange movies of its time. This movie is filled with self-references. If you were a Josie and the Pussycats fan, you will be pleased. You know what? I still don't understand why you're here. I'm here because I was in the comic book. What? Nothing. And this is more than your standard rise to the top story. We see some exaggerated truths about the fickleness of the music industry. Record labels view their talent as easily replaceable and easy to dispose. It's giving Abby Lee Miller vibes. In the universe of this movie, the Pussycats were signed to become industry plants, and that term itself has caused lots of discussions on social media. I remember when Billie Eilish was getting popular, there were rumors that she was an industry plant. And these same rumors targeted Olivia Rodrigo in 2021. And you could say that the K-pop industry is a machine fueled by industry plants. Similarly to How the Grinch Stole Christmas, there is some commentary on the culture of overconsumption, which can be one explanation for the heavy use of product placement. And corporations kidnap and brainwash nonconformists? What? Mind control and subliminal messages are one of the biggest themes in this movie and as one of the biggest rumors in the entertainment industry. The writers were onto something. Since this movie is based off a cartoon, the main type of humor shown is absurdism. Makes sense because the entertainment industry and fame culture is inherently absurd. This also has the same tone as the golden age of Tumblr, aka the home of absurdist humor. There's one scene where Carson Daly and Aries Spears attempts to K-word two of the girls but it looks like Carson and Melody might hit it off together. But really, it's all in the name of distracting him, and Melody saves herself. In a lot of movies, they would end up together in the end, but he actually tried to unalive her so he can go eat rocks. My favorite song in this movie is the one where they get an entire diva makeover and leave the salon looking exactly the same. 
and the in movie hit song has been stuck in my head all week. It really is stuck in my head now. Like, am I gonna get mind controlled? It's sort of like the ring scenario. Like, we all saw the cursed videotape, so are we gonna get cursed now too? I need to stop, I'm getting scared. When I rewatched this movie, I kept thinking about how much this reminded me of Barbie. Both took a pre existing, light hearted, familiar piece and used it to make a grander statement, and mixed in surreal humor styles and in-jokes for the fans. But I think Josie and the Pussycats did it better because Barbie is just a bit too existential for my taste. One year later, another live-action comedy based on a 1970s cartoon came out and made over three times its budget. I'm about to start some mess, but I never got into this movie. And in 2007, Alvin and the Chipmunks would come out and would become even more massive showing another losing oneself to fame storyline. So I don't think it's fair that Josie and the Pussycats got looked over. But nowadays, this movie has won its flowers as one of the most self-reflective meta films ever made. And speaking of cats... Catwoman is a character that has been frequently shown in media for decades. She made her live action debut in the 1960s Batman TV show and had an even bigger role in Batman Returns. But a Catwoman movie was trapped in development hell. Michelle Pfeiffer and Ashley Judd both dropped out of playing Catwoman due to a lack of interest. And directors and executive producers didn't seem too interested in the project either. For some time, it seemed like a Catwoman movie was never going to be made. But things started looking up when Warner Brothers pushed for this movie to be made as quickly as possible after a Batman vs Superman project got cancelled. Halle Berry was a good, convenient choice for the lead. She already planned to star in her own James Bond spin-off movie, but that movie also got cancelled, so why not play a feline superhero instead? All with a fan service ready outfit. The Catwoman's costume is still one of the most talked about aspects of this movie. The creators wanted to show the progression from demure, repressed patience to the sensual awakening of a sexy warrior goddess. But Hallie didn't really feel like a sexy warrior goddess because she stated that her outfit was very tight and very uncomfortable. But pleather outfits aside, she still had high hopes for this movie and approached this role with lots of thought and consideration. She made up her own thesis for her character and even took whip cracking lessons. That seems fun. So we have a summer blockbuster starring an A-list movie star with an energetic atmosphere with an iconic anti-heroine finally getting her own movie. Audiences are gonna go crazy for this. And they did. Just not the way Warner Brothers were hoping for. Even before Catwoman was released, things were not looking too good. It tested so poorly with audiences, reshoots had to be done just one month before the premiere. And on top of that, the fans detested the trailer. Supposedly, Catwoman fans expected a movie about Selina Kyle, but instead got a brand new character who never appeared in any DC comics. But that would be the least of the movie's issues. The vast majority of critics despise the writing, editing style, the over-the-top performances, and its supposed actualization of Catwoman. For a long time, this was considered one of the worst movies ever made. It didn't even make back its $100 million budget. This movie alone was credited to ending Halle Berry's career as a bankable star. But despite it being a financial flop, it still was the highest grossing female-led superhero movie, until Wonder Woman claimed that title in 2017. Maybe beneath all the groans, deep down, Catwoman had something going on. It has to have something. Like when I look up some info as to why people don't like this movie, so many responses just say, because it's bad. Like, what an amazing analysis. I have so much to work with that. So based off the critiques of this movie, you'd think that Catwoman would be an absolute car wreck. But I felt like Catwoman represented something different. Here's the thing. What if we saw Catwoman from the perspective of it being a surrealist farce? Almost a parody of superhero movies. The villains literally did that evil laugh thing. I think the writers had some self-awareness. And while Catwoman embodies the essence of a popcorn movie, it also has the faults that popcorn movies tend to have. The writing does seem a bit rushed, and I will admit that the editing at times is pretty jarring. And that's because it was a hastily put together script, and underwent last minute reshoots. The outfit of Catwoman received heavy criticism, 
But aside from the impractical, non-stretchy material, I don't see how an outfit like this is a world of a difference from Spider-Man wearing full-length tights. I mean, Tom Holland had a sudden underwear scene, but there is truth that in movies, female characters are typically expected to wear smaller, tighter clothes than male characters. That is definitely a thing. But there are more egregious examples of this phenomenon than Catwoman. I actually prefer that outfit she wore in the bank scene. It looked more fierce. And I keep thinking how insane it is that Halle Berry's career would never be the same after Catwoman. Every other actor in Hollywood gets a financial and critical slump every now and then, but apparently Halle has to have an absolutely perfect track record. It's giving double standards. And though Halle Berry's performance received lots of criticism, I don't think that she did anything particularly wrong. She's just working with what was given to her. Patience starts off being believably shy and meek, and once she hits rock bottom, she is gifted the breath of life by a cat. I know the scene is very dramatic and over the top, but in a surreal sense, it's kind of awesome. The background music adds so much. And after she's given the spirit of a cat, she becomes that girl, plotting her revenge to all of her wrongdoers. When you do some clownery, the clown comes back to bite. Or in this case, the cat. And oh yeah, there's a romance subplot. She gets to be a cool anti-heroine and dates a cute guy. Ooh. The general feel of her performance after the Catwoman transformation just feels so sassy and confident. I live for sassiness in general, so I love to see it. And so did quite a lot of people. It seems like more audiences openly enjoys Catwoman today than in 2004. What particularly resonates with some viewers is seeing Patience transformation, not just becoming more cat-like, but seeing how self-assured she becomes. It's the thesis of the Catwoman character, period. Going from an insecure woman who is unsure of herself to someone who gets a complete personality makeover and becomes someone who stands their ground. We all love some interpersonal development. Catwoman was a mix of things. It's a standard Hollywood blockbuster with a girly edge and a dash of surrealism. And on top of that, you could say that this movie opened the doors for other cat movies. Cats came out in 2020, and it was certainly a thing that happened. Anyways. History has a tendency to repeat itself. Works that were hated in its time are now frequently being reinterpreted. Centuries ago, Shakespeare's plays were looked down upon. I'm not comparing anything that I talked about to Shakespeare, but you get what I mean. And media that's coming out right now might be interpreted differently in the future. Honestly, I feel like at this point of time, being outraged by media of all things seems like a waste of energy. And by that, I mean unnecessary outrage. Like the Avantika Rapunzel situation is so weird to me because people are making TikToks of them crying over a fan cast. I just don't understand having all this emotional energy over a fan cast. Like, it's so bizarre. And keep in mind that the critics and masses don't have the final word. I've seen people explain why they like some movies that I'm personally not a fan of, but I can understand why that piece of media resonated with them. And a lot of movies that I personally enjoy aren't known to be critically acclaimed. Many of them have mixed reviews. I don't see movies like Clueless, Marie Antoinette, or Black Swan being on any best movies ever made lists, so maybe my tastes run differently. We'll let the mixed reviews be mixed. It makes the actual content more intriguing to watch. And that's all I have for re-examining some critically mixed movies. What is a movie that you enjoy, but it seems like a lot of people don't like? I will make more content on media, trends, and internet culture, so I hope to see you all in the next one.